Welcome to today's MAR Colloquium Records Management in the Cloud. Our guest speaker is uh, Mary Beth Herkert. She's State Archivist for the Oregon State Archives. Uh, Mary Mary Beth uh, has had roles as archivist as well as records manager and manager of information and records management unit. Uh, I met Mary Beth working on an ARMA task force and I know she's been active presenting in SAA as well, uh, specifically uh, at last summer's conference. I was uh, very aware of that. Uh, Mary Beth is both a CRM and a CA, so she is very well versed in both the records and the archival aspect of the issue that she's going to speak with you tonight about, uh, which is records management in the cloud. So I'm going to turn the mic over to Mary Beth right now. This is a, I, I've been doing archives and records management now for almost 30 years and um, if you had told me 30 years ago that I would be spending my time on nothing but um, IT or computer issues um, related to records, um, I would have thought you were nuts. But um, anyway, it's, it's something that's new, something that's um, kind of innovative for most people to think of even doing business um, in the cloud, uh, although we're really kind of being forced into it. Um, the, the whole gist or the major portion of, the, of this presentation is going to be kind of how we have embraced the cloud to actually um, do records management. We've actually put our electronic records management system in the cloud and have made it a statewide system for all state and local government agencies to use. So um, with that, um, what is really the cloud? Um, it, it's a very general term. Some people narrowly define it as virtual servers over the internet. Others are more broadly define it as anything you consume outside your firewall. But really, it involves delivering hosted services over the internet. Um, and they're divided into kind of like three types of services. Um, infrastructure as a service, platform as a service, and software as a service. I am um, most familiar with um, software as a service as that is what we are providing. But the infrastructure as a service is um, where you pay, as you, you pay for what you use. It's also um, kind of commonly known as utility computing because it's like you, your utilities. What you use, you pay for. So a lot of it has to deal with storage, um, different things that you may do on the, on the um, it, uh, internet, like something like Amazon Web Services. Platform as a service is, is more like um, development tools that are um, hosted um, on the provider's infrastructure, like Google Apps. The, the one problem with that is, is there are no standards for these um, um, services related to interoperability or portability, so you have some limitations, and some of these platform as a service providers will not allow you to move anything that you develop off of their, um, their platform. So you're um, kind of stuck there um, if you're doing something internally on, on that. And then software as a service is where your vendor is supplying the hardware, the software, the infrastructure, um, and then you access it through a web portal so that you can use the service. Um, basically, it really represents what you're doing um, on a day-to-day -day basis. If you, if you didn't know it was in a cloud, you would never realize that. And, and most of your um, web email um, providers are, are going into the cloud now. For example, the state of Oregon has just entered into an agreement with USA.net um, to provide um, Microsoft um, Outlook over in the cloud, and, and we just switched over to that in June, and really you can't tell the difference um, as if it was on your computer, as it was, a, you know, a, a internally hosted app as opposed to being a virtual hosted app. Um, so all of them um, have, have their place, and all of them are in a wide variety of um, development and, and use. Um, the Synergy Data Center that I have um, listed there is that's our host for our electronic records management system, and, and we'll continue to go um, and talk about that in a little bit here. But really, the, the three things that differentiate um, the cloud from traditional hosting is it, it's sold on demand. You only pay for what you use. Um, so if you're not going to use it, you don't pay for it. 
um, it's elastic, so you can grow at whatever rate you want to go. Of course, if you want to grow, you're going to pay more for what you're getting. Um, so it, it's not free, and that's the one thing that, that people need to understand is there are costs involved with it, um, but you basically are only paying for what you use. And the nice thing about it, and it, the, what a lot of people find good about this is that it's fully managed by the provider, so it really frees up your IT staff to do stuff that internally needs to be developed and, and used. So um, it, you don't have to worry about anything. So a software upgrade comes along, the vendor is going to upgrade it for you. Um, so you don't have to expand your, um, expand your IT staff to, to do the job for you. Um, the reasons really for cloud development um, are, are kind of um, Threefold, I guess, if you want to say, um, I think the last is the, the biggest reason, especially when you look at government, is um, innovations in virtualization and, and distributed computing. I mean, the, the industry has grown so much over the last couple of years that it really makes it more of an option for most people. Um, again, improved access to high-speed Internet. Um, as more and more people have access to it, they can do things in the cloud. However, when you get into some states, and, and I mean, it's not just um, the, uh, the wild, wild west, if you want to say, but there, there are a lot of states where the rural areas still only have dial-up access to the Internet. So cloud computing is not going to work for them um, because you have to have the, the, the advantage of the high-speed Internet. And, and like I said, the last reason, which I think is the biggest reason, especially when you look at government, is it's a weak economy. And, you know, when we talk about um, our situation, you will see how much less expensive it is for us to do this in the cloud as it would have been for us to host it internally. Um, and, and with government, with budgets being cut, especially in this area of, of uh, archives and records management, um, it's it's something that you always need to find new and innovative ways that are more efficient and cost effective to do your business. And so um, I can speak to the government perspective on this. Um, a lot of people in the private industry, you know, it, the, the reasons may not be the same, but um, speaking from the government point of view, um, that's where we're at. Um, there's two types of cloud. There's a public cloud, uh, which sells services to anyone on the Internet. You know, so USA.net is a public cloud. Um, Amazon is a public cloud. Yahoo, Gmail, they're all public clouds. Anybody can join. Anybody can um, access them. Um, a private cloud is more where you're controlling who your users are. And um, it's usually limited to a certain group of people. And there's been a lot of talk um, about a government cloud. That would be a private cloud in that only government entities would be allowed to access and use the services that are in the cloud. We have set up a private cloud. It was the only way that we could comply with the laws in the state of Oregon um, to do what we are doing. Um, so we, we set up a private cloud. Public clouds pose lots of problems for government entities, and, and we'll get into that too. Um, and where we get into that is, is in the advantages and the disadvantages. And really, when you look at the advantages, um, the potential savings are, are really key. And like I said earlier, especially in, in these economic times, but I mean, you can save hundreds of thousands of dollars in, in um, infrastructure costs, software costs, hardware costs, um, and, and, and staff time, um, IT costs. Um, so that's really why people look to the clouds is because they, they think, well, we're going to save all this money so and get the same package. So we're going to go ahead and do it. Um, but there are always, all of these advantages have their disadvantages too. Um, potential speed, it can be faster than your internal setups um, because the people who own the clouds are, have the latest and greatest technology. They're, they're ensuring that, that um, people are only getting the best equipment, that everything is configured to the, the maximum, to reach the maximum potential of, of the software or the service that they're providing. So really you're getting a situation where you get the best. And a lot of times 
when you're hosting it internally, you're dealing with maybe servers that are three or four years old or, um, you know, you've configured it one way so you have to kind of uh, adapt the, the piece of software you're trying to add so it meets your, config, your internal configuration um, and that kind of thing. And so you really do have an advantage there, um, but it can also be a disadvantage. Um, and it frees up your IT staff. And, and for like our agency, um, we, the agency I work for, I work for the Secretary of State. Um, we have about 200 employees and our IT staff is constantly developing new applications for the very distinct program areas that are um, part of the Secretary of State's agency. But um, you really need to weigh the advantages and disadvantages and, and you need to do that, that business or case study um, that's not even not only a cost benefit analysis, but really a, a good business case to see if the application you're looking at should be in the cloud um, because you do have some real distinct disadvantages. Um, lack of ownership and control. You do not control your information. Once you have it in the cloud, basically the vendor is controlling it for you. So um, to, to say that you, that that is a huge give up, especially in government. Um, that really violates almost every statute in all 50 states when it comes to ownership of public records. Um, they belong to the state. They belong to the citizens of the state. So when you send them out to the cloud and you're letting somebody else own them, um, you can be, get into some really big legal issues. Security is another thing. Um, uh, on a, uh, daily, I think, on the records management listserv, we see issues about something being hacked, the cloud's not secure, they lost this information, they lost that information. And those are all problems that you can face when you are playing the cloud, especially if you're in a public cloud. Um, how do you secure your information so it's not getting hacked? How do you, how do you deal with things like that? So again, um, it, your advantages, I have to weigh your disadvantages. And then finally for me and for records managers everywhere, how do you apply retention and disposition to, if you don't own and control the information, it's highly unlikely that somebody like Yahoo is going to say, oh yeah, the state of Oregon, the archivist there wants you to keep that information for six years. I'm going to retain it for six years for them. Uh-uh. They're going to keep it for as long as they want it and that's as long as it's going to be there. Um, and so you can't really apply your retention and disposition um, unless you make provisions for that ahead of time. And so for us, we immediately had to eliminate playing in the public cloud um, for, for what we were doing is because we had to maintain ownership and we had to um, be able to apply retention and disposition. Um, so uh, those are really, you know, what, what you're looking at. But if you don't, I mean, we're, what we put in the cloud is an electronic records management system. So we're going to control it, retention and disposition. But if you don't have an electronic records management system, how are you going to apply retention and disposition in the cloud? For example, if we didn't have our electronic records management system, all of our email, we pay for storage of all of our email messages. They don't manage them for us. And so we would be paying very long term um, storage costs because we wouldn't know how to otherwise apply retention and disposition in USA.net. So the only reason we went into a public cloud for email is because we had a private cloud that was going to manage our information and we require everybody to put um, email messages that have, uh, that are considered public records into the electronic records management system. So um, those are some of the things that you need to kind of take a look at when you're going into the cloud. Um, it, and it's fairly new and, and a lot of people don't understand the ownership piece of it. I mean, it's like Facebook. Um, anybody who has a Facebook page knows that you don't get to, you don't get to pull stuff off when you want to or retain it for as long as you want to. Facebook's basically doing that for you. Um, Twitter, the, 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 the thing with Twitter is, is the Library of Congress is saving all of the tweets, so you definitely don't have any control over that. I mean, you can remove them, but Library of Congress is keeping them forever, so um, every t 
Twitter message that you've sent, just remember it's at the Library of Congress forever right now. Um, so I, 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 it's not my favorite um, thing to do, but so pretty much um, I, I'll get into why did we go into the clouds with knowing everything that we we knew well. Part of the problem is, is for the past 10 years, I have been trying to get the state to have uh, a unified way of managing electronic records. Um, we, we at the State Archives have always kind of been proactive. My predecessor and I, in 1995, tried to get email, uh, an email policy uh, written for the state that would have said that email messages could only be for routine communications and anything that had substance with it would have had to have been sent as an attachment so that we could manage the attachments outside of email and not have to worry about internal communications. Um, we were basically laughed out of the room. Um, nobody thought that uh, it was a problem in 1995. You know, what's this email thing? It's not going to be an issue and we don't want to be bothered with it. Um, Fast forward 10 years, 11 years, and we have all these CIOs coming up to us and saying, you know, we wish we had listened to you. Um, because now they're having to manage all these messages that vary in retention and, and content. So it became real apparent to us that something had to be done um, to manage information in a routine and systematic manner within the state. Um, we had a state agency and a city um, have major lawsuits um, placed against them for the misuse or mishandling of public records. The, the first case was our um, state accident insurance fund, um, and they were fined. Um, basically, it came out to about two and a half million dollars was their fine for um, well circumventing the, the the public records laws. And so, you know, you can buy. An electronic records management system for significantly less than two and a half million dollars, depending on your agency size. So, um, why are we spending all this money in lawsuits instead of managing our information? The city of Beaverton was probably more noted because they faced Nike, um, and guess who won? It wasn't the city of Beaverton; it was um, Nike, and they're you know had all the money to throw at it. So, their their fine was over a million dollars um, for not for being able to produce um, all their electronic records. So we had beginnings um, that really started with these really big lawsuits and, and no way of managing information. Anybody who's tried to manage um, electronic records manually finds it's really difficult to do. I mean, how do you go through all your terabytes of information on your file servers and apply retention to it? Um, it, 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 it isn't, um, I, I it is a really onerous task. Um, some of the other issues are is how to comply with the law. And the problems with the laws are is most of them were written way before the, even the personal computer was um, developed or in, in high use. How do you apply retention? And then um, we really wanted to build off of what we did um, here as the Secretary of State's agency with our electronic records management system. We were able to get funding for a system in 2007. Um, we bought our system, which was um, at the time Tower Trim. Uh, it's now HP Trim. Um, and the reason we selected our system was because it was extremely user friendly and it was truly an off the shelf um, product. So it, it made life really um, easy for us once we implemented. Um, and so how could we let others take advantage of what we've already done? Because um, it doesn't make sense, it never made sense to me that um, every state agency, every city, every county in Oregon, every special district, all of which I have jurisdiction over, were spending, going to spend upwards of a million dollars to implement an electronic records management system. Why couldn't we have a statewide system that people could take advantage of? So then it became is how we're going to do that. Well, the first thing we have to do, and, and we're moving along without it happening quite yet, but if you look at the public records law, and our public records law, and that's the top part right here, our public records law is, um, 
is like every other state's public records law, except ours is divided into two parts. So we have one for retention and disposition, and we have one for access. They're basically the exact same. Um, this, current, this current law was written in 1961. Um, really, at that time, computers occupied entire rooms. Nobody had a personal computer. Nobody had a Facebook page. Um, nobody was tweeting. Um, so really, the law assumed that a record was something that was tangible. And in 1989, they amended it to add in the part for machine-readable records. And that was all well and good, but again, it always assumed that the record was something tangible and something that was able to be captured. And it always was owned by the state um, or the public entity that was creating the record. So not a big deal. Well, fast forward to, you know, to now, and we have a definition that really does not work in today's day and age. So um, what I, I decided to do is, is that we needed to, to get a new definition. And the, the definition, the proposed new definition is at the bottom. Um, and it basically makes the law technology independent and focuses on the fact that it is the content of the information that carries the retention and not the media that transmits or is used to communicate um, the record. So, um, currently, it has been through the House, because um, we're in a legislative session right now. It's passed the House. It was then sent to the Senate, was amended in the Senate, but passed the Senate. So now it has to go back to House for concurrence. Um, right now, my bill is being held hostage for another bill, like any um, good public records or um, I guess good any piece of legislation, it always gets held hostage or something else. Uh, rumor has it that it may have its concurrence vote tomorrow. We're really hopeful because this will make my life a lot easier when I'm trying to work um, managing information, especially in the cloud. Um, I, I originally wanted to change it for social media, but it really even becomes more important when you're trying to manage information in the cloud. Um, are there any questions or anybody have anything right now that they have a question on? Um, so we came up with this idea of having a um, statewide electronic records management system, and it's now known affectionately at, known as um, Oregon Records Management Solution, or the Oregon Records Management Solution. Um, we looked at doing it in-house, uh, hosting it in-house, and allowing people to just buy off of it. It was far too costly. We couldn't get the price under um, a hundred and probably a hundred and fifty dollars per user per month, and there was nobody who would buy into the system for that. The state of Michigan is currently doing this, pursuing this option in house, and their fee is somewhere between a hundred and hundred and twenty five dollars per user per month um, to use the system and it'll be interesting to see how um, well it's received and how well theirs is going to be used. Um, we have, uh, so then we decided, uh, actually it, it's really good because my, my CIO of my agency is probably as crazy as I am when it gets to creative, new, and, and innovative ideas, and so she, she's the one who came up with the, the, the SaaS solution or the software as a service solution. Um, but what were going to be the logistics of it? How are we going to do it? How could we bring it so it actually was going to make sense? and be affordable. Um, first of all, we had, it, the way the state of Oregon is set up is we had to get um, delegated authority from the Department of Administrative Services to even offer contracts to certain state agencies because they're required to buy things from the Department of Administrative Services and not from us. So we had to leap that hurdle. And we had to leave the, the Department of Justice's hurdles over how to, how to actually put this out for, for bid, you know, go through the whole RFP process, go um, as, you know, how narrow to make it, how wide to make it, um, everything else. So we finally got through all of that, and that took almost a year of the logistics piece to get it set up. Um, we put the um, request for proposal out to bid, 
And um, the only thing we did designate was is that whatever the solution was, um, it had to use HP Trim as its electronic records management software. And that's because that's what we know. That's what we are we know how to use. Um, that's what we're using internally. It, we vetted the whole um, looking at other um, ERMS systems. Uh, when we went out for request for proposal um, in 2007, this was the solution we chose as being the best for um, what we wanted it to do. And that was, it is truly a records management tool. It was designed as a records management tool. And therefore, that's its strong point. And, and it was very, very user and user friendly. And um, those were all the reasons we, we chose this tool. So we did state in our RFP that um, whoever the vendor was, they had to use HP Trim. Uh, we did get um, some responses back, and the, the winning vendor um, came from uh, Baker City, Oregon, which is clear on the other side of the state. It's a, almost 400 miles from Salem. Um, it's closer to Idaho, the Idaho border, than it is um, to the, the um, to the valley. Uh, and the Synergy Data Center, and they're not necessarily a new company, but they have a fairly new data center, and they were looking for applications to host, and um, they're highly dedicated to this process because of a number of reasons. Is A, they truly believe that the data center that they're offering it is, it is superior to anything um, the rest of the state has. And B, for every 100 jobs they create in Baker City, it's like creating 50,000 jobs in Portland, Oregon. So they see this as a, as a huge boon for, for their economy over there. And they have really good IT people surrounding them. Um, what they did in turn was partner with, um, they bought and brokered all the licenses through HP Trim, I mean, all the tr HP Trim licenses through Hewlett Packard. Um, so we didn't even negotiate with them. We only negotiate with the folks at Chaz Consulting in the Synergy Data Center. Um, so our partnership is with them. They can have a multitude of partners out there. A uh, couple of things that we, we insisted upon was is that AVIS had to be a private cloud, that we would control all our information. They could never remove our information from it um, um, because we are setting this up based on retention and disposition. Um, we're not setting it up uh, for them to, you know, we don't care about what their storage is. So if they can't expand their storage, then that wasn't going to be a feasible um, solution for us. Um, so we set that up in the contract so that it is a government cloud. It is a state of, you know, a state of Oregon cloud. However, we are looking to maybe partner with Washington and Idaho, or, but that's another story for another day. Um, so we, you know, we're, we're sitting there. They're, they're in a completely different geographic area than we are. Um, they are in a geographic, basically safe zone. Um, whereas in the valley, we're subjected to earthquakes um, and, and uh, volcanic, volcanic action, activity. Baker City um, is basically in a geographically neutral area. Um, unlike the coast, we, we couldn't go to the coast because of the tsunami hazard over there. Um, so really, it was nice having it in a different part of the state. Um, and and for, from a, a, a part of our security and, and disaster recovery um, era. So um, that's why, and, and they are a tier three data center. Um, we asked for a minimum of a tier two data center. They actually are a tier three data center. So that means they, meet, they exceed even the state data center um, for security and, and um, up, up, uh, the ability to upgrade and, um, and, and grow. Uh, so um, that's why we asked the state data center to host it. They had absolutely zero interest in it because they were having a hard enough time just managing the day-to-day -day stuff um, that they currently have. So um, 
we, we have got a really good partnership with them. And to date, uh, we have nine pilot agencies, and they're all centered in the Salem, Portland area. Um, we have uh, three state agencies and one um, park and recreation district, and the rest are cities. Um, it was interesting because when we went before the legislature this session, the first comment out of one of the legislators' mouths were, well, this will probably be way too expensive for any small entity to, to enter into. And um, when I told her that one of the first signer, signers on was a park and recreation district, um, I think she, she almost um, choked. But uh, it, it, is a, it is an application that really lends itself to small, medium, and large agencies because you only pay for the number of people who are using the system. And there's direct lines, um, high-speed lines to the data center. So the folks here will be putting their data in. It will go into the data center over here. And the trim application resides on the servers over in the data center um, with a mirror, you know, with the application being technically virtually mirrored um, on their computers at their workstation. So it's no different than how you use Word. Uh, you just use the trim product and put your records in. And when you want to recall them, you do it the same way. So um, we, we feel really confident that, that this is, I mean, we're still in a piloting mode. Um, so but we're really confident there's nothing that lends us to, to think that it's not going to work um, on, on this. There, I mean, from a technology standpoint, it, there's nothing there for it to fail. From a records management standpoint, there's really not much to fail. So I guess it's a capacity standpoint we're looking at now is, is are we going to have problems with, with when we have thousands of users on it? Um, will we have a, a problem? We don't anticipate it, um, but it is something that we are uh, looking at as a pilot. Um, we currently have nine agencies um, in the pilot program. Um, the system was configured on June 10th, um, and data starts going in this week. Um, and the first agency to put data in will be the Department of Energy, um, who was one of our first signer honors. Um, the Secretary of State will be moving all of their information over, but it'll be after, um, after July 1, just because of um, scheduling issues with, with our IT staff. And because we're on a standalone system right now, but we're going to move over to um, the software as a service application. Uh, one of the big reasons that we're going um, going to uh, move over is, is cost. And I, I hope you can all see this slide. Um, when we implemented TRIM, our total cost was just under a million dollars. It, it was $915,000. Um, we pay on a monthly basis a little over $78.56 well, $78 per month per user. That's our maintenance fee as a standalone system that we're paying to um, HP every month um, based on our users. Um, as you can see in the far corner over here on the far right hand side, the statewide service, the, the monthly fee is $37.02. So we're going to be saving over $38 a month per user just by going into the cloud um, and, and using the software as a service model. Um, that equates for us of over $100,000, the agency as a whole of, of over $100,000 worth of savings um, per, you know, for the agency. So it didn't make sense for us to stay in a standalone system. Plus, after five years, we would have to refresh our hardware, and that's an added cost. We asked HP to give us some ballpark numbers for 500 and 1,000 users, and that's what these next two columns look at. And as you can see, 500 users would roughly be 1.15 million, 1,000 uh, users about 1.77 million, and the monthly fees would be 57.83 or 
I think $47.50. So it's pretty expensive to stay standalone. And that's what's prohibiting a lot of agencies. Oh, they want to do this. They want to manage their information because they don't want to take the risk anymore um, of, of, of not having it managed in the manner that's systematic and routine. Um, that, that to go standalone was way too cost prohibitive. And so now they're looking at, well, how can we do this? And so when we came up with this option, uh, we had a number of folks jump on. And thankfully, one of the first, well, the very first city to sign on was the city of Beaverton um, because they had that major lawsuit and they're being sued almost every day for poor management of their records. And, and so now they're putting their information into a, a records management system. They were originally just going to go with an e-discovery e solution, um, but that never, it still didn't manage their records. It just told them where they were. It would do fine searches, but it didn't really solve the problem of, of managing records and managing information. So um, they, they jumped on early, and their, their city council, although we had some pushback from their IT folks, um, their city council was like gung-ho because they saw this as a way to get some credibility back with their citizens. Um, the, the next slide just kind of shows the cost of you per user, or yeah, over five years, and the total cost for ownership. And as you can see, um, the bottom line is the state service. And, and these other lines are, are standalone systems based on, you know, how many users you have. Um, our goals, we have, we do have goals um, for our, our first year, the end of the one year, we want to be able to have 2,000 users in the system. Right now with the agencies that we have committed, uh, we have closer to three or 4,000 users right now. Um, and as, so these are, you know, by the end of five years, we hope to have 20,000 users. However, with the amount of inquiries and um, the amount of interest that I've had in this, I think it will be much sooner um, than five years that we'll hit our 20,000 users. And as you can see, the cost, if you're in a standalone system, they stay the same. Um, it doesn't matter uh, how, many, how many users that you have, you know, you're going to pay the same in a standalone system because you're not adding anybody. Really, there's no economies of scale. Um, but as you see in the statewide system, you know, when we hit um, 3,000 users, we go down to $26, then we go down to 17 and 13 and then finally $10.54. And once we hit 20,000 users, we'll negotiate a new price scale. So um, there's always cost savings because you're always adding more users on um, the system. So. Uh, it, it really does make sense um, to share something like this uh, because it's, it's not something that everybody can afford, but if you make it so that you can take advantage of, you know, the state of Oregon, you know, has, well, I, I don't know how many millions of people in it, and you don't, you know, how many of those actually are affiliated with a government entity or work for a government entity. You know, we can have a, a million users and have a really cheap cost, you know, um, that we would never see if we all were having our own system. So really it's good government. And then from a purely um, selfish point of view, um, it's not only is it cost effective, but as a state archivist, I'm responsible for all of these records. And really if I have them in one system, it's a heck of a lot easier for me to deal with. Then I have, if I have to have, you know, five different ERMSs that I'm dealing with, or, you know, they're all in a variety of, of, of systems. Um, so it, it, for me, it, it's cost effective, it's efficient, and then, like I said, from a selfish point of view, it, it's easy. So really, is it worth it? Um, I would say yes. And, and I, I guess I won't have a definitive answer until we're done with our pilot agencies. Um, I just think this is very good government. Um, we need to manage our electronic information. It's not being managed now. Um, even those with the best intentions uh, have 
files and, and on file servers that are in software um, that are is no longer able to be accessed or read. Um, we we are spending millions of dollars in storage per year. Um, I, I kind of equate. I was asked to do a presentation before um, the the folks who use the state data center, which is projecting a 500% growth over the next year, um, with the, with the agencies that are already there, and basically that equates really. We've become a a society of virtual hoarders. So any of you who have seen that show, Hoarding Buried Alive. That's what we are when it comes to information on our servers is we don't manage it. We just push it away. It's out of sight, out of mind. And if we were in the paper world still and we had that much information, we would all be fired because um, nobody would have bought us all those extra filing cabinets and warehouses to store this information in. Um, it's just it's out of sight, out of mind. We don't manage it until we get an e-discovery request, a public records request, or um, you know, it comes to the point where we have all this obsolete information and we have no clue as to what it is. And so can we throw it away? We don't know because we don't really know what it is. We don't know what a pretension to apply to it. And we really have no way of action, accessing it. So um, electronic records management system is something that is really, I think, is key to any archives and records management program down the road. Having it in the cloud, I think is a way to make it affordable for the largest agencies as well as the smallest agencies. And um, it just makes us uh, more cost effective and more efficient. Um, and I know those are the buzzwords of the day um, for, for most state agencies. But um, I, I think that, you know, whether it's in the cloud or whether it's standalone, um, you know, you can make a case for both, but I think this is an application that in the right situation, in the right cloud, um, because of all the, um, the steps that we took ahead of time to make sure that we could manage, we could control and actually manage information in the cloud, this is really a good solution for us. And um, we have put in a grant to see if we can't get the state of Washington to look at doing their, uh, using our cloud for their records management solution and then taking the permanent records and also storing them at the Washington State Digital Archives in Cheney, Washington. So working kind of a cooperative venture, two clouds, one that's storing permanent records, one that's managing the day-to-day -day information. And, and I really hope that um, we get the, the opportunity to do that and, and get the grant to do it. So. Um, I guess it, it's been a lot of work. It's not something that was created overnight. Um, but I think that using the cloud in the right situation it is, is, is a really viable alternative to, to managing stuff independently and on their own. And I, I think really with such a weak economy, people had to look at ways, better ways to do things that we're going to save money, and that's why the cloud has really come to the forefront. Uh, we have issues that we need to deal with. Security is a huge one. But again, if we can kind of all look at, you know, you're the user of the cloud, and the users can have a large voice. And if your vendor doesn't want to make the cloud secure, the vendor doesn't want to um, do different things if the users band together and, 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 and work with that vendor, they're going to leave the vendor and go to somebody who will. So I, I think we, as more and more people enter into the cloud, um, I think you're going to see a lot of changes as far as security and um, portability and updatability and that sort of thing with, with what's going on there. Um, and But I guess only time will tell, but I don't think the cloud is going away um, unless something new comes up down the road that's better and bigger and, and which I'm sure it will. Um, the one thing I've learned in 30 years of doing this is, is there's something always new around the corner and um, that'll be bigger, better, and faster. And, and so it'll be something else that I need to use and learn. So if you guys have more information, you have questions, um, you can have questions now. Do you feel that one software can meet the needs of all state agencies? Um, 
For electronic records management, yes. Um, I think uh, it, it, it will. Um, I think you need to find the right product. Um, I know we have a couple of agencies that are playing around with a couple of other products and they haven't been able to fully implement. Uh, we were able to implement a lot quicker. Uh, I think it depends on who's, who's offering it and who's controlling, it, you know, managing it. I think the real advantage for us is we're the ones who are providing all the training and um, uh, information for these guys so, so they get an advantage because they, for their, their, for their $37, they're getting uh, undivided um, archives attention and records managers attention. Um, but I, I think that there are other things that people can put into the cloud and I think that's what's going to end up happening is, is you'll see that states will start putting more applications in the cloud and once you get a, a secure government cloud, I think I wouldn't be surprised if, if, if um, we find other things to have Synergy host for us as, as an application. I, I really do think that um, that's, good. that's one of the, the, the second question was how do you move permanent records from the cloud to a digital preservation repository? Um, that's a good question. That's what we hope to find out from that grant is, is how hard or how difficult or easy or difficult is that going to be and is it even feasible? Um, and it's, it's going to depend a lot on, on Washington's IT folks and then our IT folks and contractors. Um, does HP Trim follow DOD 5015? Yes, it does. Um, and that is a statewide requirement that any electronic records management system that any agency purchases has to be DOD 5015.2 certified. Um, it can't just be compliant, it has to be certified. Um, that was one of the keys that, to it to make it um, give me the latitude that I need as the state archivist to ensure that um, these systems are going to be around for a while and, and that I can move information around. Hi, Mary Beth. What a, what a wonderful summary and, and uh, presentation. Thank you very much. I was, you used the word social media once in, in your presentation. Do you intend to use software as a service or the TRIM HP technology to manage social media in the future? Um, <laughs> yes, uh, we're, trying to, we're trying to figure out to, to do that. Um, one, the problem is, is really right now is, is trying to capture something that was never intended to be captured. Um, what we're hoping to do is with the change in the law is basically say that I don't care if you put it on Facebook, I just want to be able to, you can get, send it to me in a Word document or whatever, whatever you've posted, you can send it to me in another format um, because the content is what, what we care about, not the, um, not the uh, the medium that it's on. So, and in that case, those documents would be put into HP Trim. There are a couple of things that are out there that you can capture social media in. It basically exports the content into an Excel spreadsheet or a tab delineated text file. Um, those things could go into Trim too. Um, but I think as social media develops along the way and more government agencies are using it, they're going to kind of we'll see products developed and maybe that are better at capturing and, and then yes, we would be putting that information into, into the um, TRIM database. Okay, we have a second. Another question is, uh, let's see, do I have any idea how many state archives are using the cloud and who are some of the others? I know of um, nobody using it for this particular application. And in fact, um, it has become a vendor frenzy out here. Um, I think because I can't, I can't copyright our idea or our solution. Um, so I know for a fact that um, HP is trying to hurriedly put together their own um, application. I know Michigan is doing something, but it's more internal. They really haven't gone out to the cloud um, unless, because they're hosting it internally. So I really don't, I think there's a lot of states who are using the cloud for email um, because it's, that's an easy savings to justify, but there's nobody who's using it to manage their records um, at, that I know of. 
Let's see, how did I get around the legal requirements pertaining to government security on the cloud without directly owning the data stored? Well, the nice thing about the cloud that we're in, it is a private cloud and we do control the information and we do own the information. Um, and that's clearly stated in our contract and our attorneys made sure that was clearly stated in the contract. And then every entity that enters into the uh, service level agreement with the um, contractor or the vendor, um, it clearly states in there too that it's their information, they own it, and they're controlling it through the use of HP Trim. Uh, one of the things that we are doing is we're still going, the state archives that is, is still going to control the, um, uh, the, the destruction. We will send out just quarterly destruction requests to the agencies and they will give us permission to delete. Um, we toyed with the idea of giving each agency that option and then realized that we would quickly, um, because I know from working with government agencies, you get most people who never destroy a thing um, or those who are going to try to manipulate it a little bit. So we're controlling that part um, until such time as I have the confidence to, to maybe switch that over to them. But um, in the, in the, for as long as the very near future and the future out there for a while, we will continue to, to, to do the destructions of the actual information in the system. So we, we were able, everything we did was with re regards to abiding by the statutes for ownership of, of public information. And then the nice thing is too is, is this piece of software allows us to have a web portal so the public can directly access um, the immediate, um, the, the record, because we're also classifying our information as to whether it's um, readily available, um, it has to be available to the agency, is secured or is critical. So we have a classification of one through four. The ones are all the readily available. All that information immediately goes out to a public web portal um, so that the public can directly access it. So we're actually making the information more accessible um, than it currently is right now. So the public is still the owners of the information. Okay, the next question is, it seems that an open source ERMS software would have great benefit long term. Um, I understand that Alfresco is the only one that claims to be open source. Do you think there is a need for such development in the RM profession? Um, I've been waiting almost 15 years for the National Archives to come up with their solution and uh, haven't gotten it yet. Uh, couldn't wait any longer, so went out. I think it is a natural. I, I don't know why it hasn't, we haven't had something that was um, out there. I think part of the reason is, is that from a, a purely vendor standpoint is why should they develop something that everybody's going to be able to use um, when you can sell it and make money off of it as opposed to being, you know, open source and not maybe so profitable. Um, you know, I, I don't know. I, I mean, I'm all for one that I like simple, I like easy, I don't like reinventing the real. So, real. so um, I, I, I think it's a, a great thing. Um, how long it's going to be before we get there, I don't know. Um, it'd be nice. Let's see, I'm new in this area, but I'm wondering how the records are organized in the cloud. Does every agency have control over how their records are organized? Yes. Every agency has a sector of the cloud or their information. So I, I, well, I as the system administrator can see everybody's information, but let's say I as the Secretary of State cannot go in and look at and control, do anything to the city of Beaverton's records. Um, the city of Beaverton things can't play with the city of Milwaukee's records and on and on. So everybody has their own control and that's set up by um, doing, there's a lot of things in the background that have to happen. For every agency that we work with, we develop a, a file classification system based on their records retention schedule and their court, their business processes. Um, and we set, set up roles and responsibilities for every single collect user within the city or within the agency that's in the system. So we can control things like that. But all of Beaverton's employees have one part of it. Um, so they're sectored off um, in the system. Um, Let's see. 
Although you own the data, are you hosting within your own infrastructure or is it in an external site using virtual VMs? In which case, writing your SLA, did you negotiate for notification in the case of hacking or other security breaches? We are going, we currently we're internal. Um, we have our own infrastructure, but after July 1, we will be moving to the external site. And yes, in our SLAs, we did negotiate um, all of this stuff for notification for and hacking or other security breaches. Um, we insisted upon certain levels of security before we would even enter it. Like I said, we insisted they had to be a tier two data center, which means they have a certain level of infrastructure built in for security purposes and, and redundancies built in and that sort of thing. Um, we also uh, have, have contingencies within, I don't know what the legal term is in the contract, but, you know, if this happens or if something happens, who's responsible and, you know, what, what steps need to be taken. So we were very careful in, in, in putting, you know, step by step having that process clearly stated because we did not want, I mean, if you're, it's one thing if we were doing it ourselves, the Secretary of State was the only ones doing it, but when you start adding in cities and counties and other state agencies and some of the state agencies, one of the state agencies that's on board in the pilot is um, the Department of Human Services, their child welfare section. Um, the last thing I need is a data breach with child records, children's records. And um, so we had to make sure that we had all this clearly outlined in the, in the contract. And as I said earlier, um, the data center we're in is actually a tier three, so they've even achieved higher levels than a tier two. So um, they assure us, and we have it in the, all in the contract, that we're pretty, we're pretty secure on this. Thank you very much, Mary Beth. Uh, I enjoyed your presentation, and uh, the participants had excellent questions. Um, so we really appreciate your being with us this evening. Uh, and thank you, everyone, for attending.